So here's a true story. I'm in kindergarten and I'm old enough to remember we had cops used to escort us across the street at certain intersections. And we used to have an older cop. His name was Mr. Good, black older cop. And when we used to cross the street, he would say things like, okay, y'all make sure you do your homework, pay attention today. Hey, so how was, how was class? And, and if any kid would act up, he would talk, all right, now cut that off or somebody get hurt. And he would say stuff like baby and all right, little children. And, you know, I love you and stuff like that. Be good. But sometimes he wouldn't be there. And he, he had a, what we call a substitute policeman, which would take his place. It'd be a, it was a middle-aged white guy. And the difference was shocking. Now, I remember I'm in kindergarten. And when we used to cross the street, he used to tell us, hurry our asses up. Come on. Get out the way. Stop playing around. Shut up. And I remember some of the older kids, the fifth and sixth graders, as they crossed the street, they said, we hate you. And he turned and got beat red and he screamed real loud in an angry face and said, I hate y'all too. Little did I know at the time, he was teaching me a valuable lesson. And in fact, his lessons have surpassed some of my elementary school teachers to this day. Welcome to another episode of Ask a Black Dad. There's a lot of turmoil right now. A lot of eyes are being awakened to a systematic racism, police brutality that's been happening. But now with the availability of phones and cameras on phones, people are seeing it and people are starting to, starting to speak their hearts and speak their minds and, and want better and protesting for better. Part of the question going around is, being passed around social media is, what was your first encounter that you can remember with racism? I'm going to take that question and, and, and look at it in a different way, and, and, and I'm going to answer it because so many times racism has been interjected into my life, and I just want to share some of these moments that are pivotal or eye-awakening to me. The first one was, I was seven years old, and I was watching the news, and I remember Boston was being forced to bust the kids. They had to send black kids to white neighborhoods and white kids to black neighborhoods because they said the school systems were, weren't, weren't being fair. They were, kids need to be uh, desegregated so that they can learn to sit with each other and, and be around each other. I'm watching the news and I see this bus of kids that were in elementary school my age and I'm watching as mothers and, and fathers, ladies who could be my mother, my grandmother, were just shouting nasty things to these little kids that were my age. They were calling them niggers and told them to go back to where they came from, spitting on them or spitting at the bus. And they had to be protected by the Boston Police Department just to bring the buses in. So that whole ride, these kids were subjected to just grown-ups who were old enough to be their parents spitting and, and cursing at them. And that made me think right then and there, they hate us. And I wanted to know why do they hate us like this? Why do they hate that little kid, which was me, because they well, could have been me. They hated us that much. That's number one. When I was 12 years old in junior high school, I was not good at math at all. I went to a school that was about 50%, it was mixed, 50%, 50% white, 50% black. And I had trouble with math and I made a friend with a girl named Anna. She was the smartest girl in our class. And I used to sit with her and she used to help me with math. I was terrible at it. Every day I'd sit down with her, she'd help me with math, sometimes after school, sometimes during uh, lunch breaks or before class, I would go sit next to her at her desk and she would help me. And this had went on for about maybe, say, a week and a half. Then one day I came to school and Anna was crying. She had been crying. And I went and talked to her. I said, what's wrong, Anna? She said all her friends who she had went to elementary school with were telling, had told her father that she was a nigger lover 
and they had stopped associating with her and they were picking with her. I was so mad, I was so upset. Me and Anna, there was no relationship as far as boyfriend, girlfriend, nothing like that. She was my friend who helped me, who was willing to help me. And at that moment, I told her I'm sorry because I felt like I had put her in this position for asking her to help me. And I told her that she didn't have to worry no more. I would never ever ask her to help me. And in fact, all I would do if I saw her in the hallway would just wave my hand high because I felt that it was dangerous now, that, that this was something that could later on cause her more harm at home and I didn't want that to happen to her. The next ex incident happens when I'm in the Marine Corps and I'm home on leave. I'm like 23, 24 years old and I'm at the mall. I'm walking through the mall and I see four guys and a girl. I'm looking and one of the guys I know is my friend Patrick from school. I knew Patrick from seventh and eighth grade. I ran up to Patrick and I just hugged him. I'm like, Patrick, how, I haven't seen you since the eighth grade because I had moved and left the neighborhood. Me and Patrick, we were poor together. In our house, we had alcoholism, abuse. We shared our stories. In fact, we were on welfare together. And what's so funny, we had meal cards. And sometimes when they had meal cards, the people who got the welfare received mashed potatoes. And so you had to buy French fries. And if I had a quarter, I'd buy French fries and I'd split it with him. If he had a quarter, he'd buy French fries and split it with me. So I'm hugging him. And I'm just so happy to see him, but I didn't feel the love coming back to me. So I'm, as I'm pulling away from him, and it's, you know, puzzled what happened, was what was happening, that's when I noticed it. One of the guys off to the side of him has the lightning bolt, SS lightning bolts on his neck. I see swastikas tattooed on their hands, FTWs and all this stuff. The girl has piercings with Nazi stuff on her. I look, Patrick has the same thing. Now these, the, the three guys and the girl are looking at me like, what the heck? And Patrick's stunned. I just looked at Patrick and I said, well, okay, Patrick, I see you got to go. But I want you to make sure you take care of yourself. All right, love you. And as I was walking away, trying to make sure they ain't hit me in the back of the head, I was wondering what had made Patrick, who was loving to me, who was my friend, all of a sudden become a racist, who didn't like blacks, Jews, or anybody, when he wasn't like that when I met him, when I was with him in the seventh and eighth grade. What part of his life made him turn to that, that, that hate? I know we had, we had problems at, at, at home, but his problems at home weren't due to people of color. So that, I, that was something that bothered me. My last incident happened about three years ago, four years ago. Me and my wife were empty nesters, so, and uh, my daughter calls me. She's, got out, she's out of college. And she's with her friends, and she's celebrating there. They're going to some girl's uh, hometown and outside of Louisville, Kentucky somewhere. And she calls at night. And uh, I answer the phone and she says, Daddy, uh, I got something to tell you. I want you to... And she goes to tell me a story about how her and her friends are in a store. And they're laughing and she's the only black girl. And her, four, her and her four friends, some white guy, a little older than them, gets in her face and screams, the South will rise again. And then this other Confederate stuff about the South and Confederacy forever. No reason. They didn't talk to him. They hadn't acknowledged him or anything. But he went to that one black girl and he thought it was necessary to show her the hate he had. And after I made sure she was okay, her mother was shooken up, I realized that I couldn't get to her right away. I couldn't protect her. And that the scars of, of racism that America placed on my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my parents, and that it placed on me, 
America made sure that it was putting it on my kids. That she had to have this rite of passage. That, that this hate had to be keep going on, getting passed down over and over and over again. So there's not one moment when racism showed its ugly head in my life. It's not it read it one time and stopped. It did it when I was young. And as I'm older now with kids of my own, it's come back around and it's showing me that it's, it's going to also do it to my children. And it's time for us to stop. It's time to really make a change. To stand up, be accounted for, and stop being quiet. And stop raising people who have this hate in their hearts. But sometimes I see hope. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I live in a, a predominantly white suburb. Every year, my neighbor throws a Christmas party. And at this Christmas party, it's an elderly man. And he's in his late 70s, early 80s. Me and my wife are the only people of color at the party. But every year, this guy cannot wait to sit and talk with me. His wife says he couldn't wait for y'all to hurry up and show. He talks about Colin Kaepernick, and he wants my opinion. He talks about Black Lives Matters, and he wants my opinion. He opens up and he shares stories of, of his father-in-law, who was a police chief, who ran black people out of, out of the town and would always give them tickets or arrest them. And he, he, he shares the stories he had in Nile. And he tells me that, that this is what it, was, what it will take, that, that everybody has to be honest, a clean reckoning. It's amazing that sometimes at the party, people will look over and see us talking and say, look at them, they got the frat brothers again, just sitting there drinking beer and chopping it up. My wife knows where to find me. I'm sitting right next to him, or we're standing, got a little plate of food, and we're just talking. And every year, because I don't, he doesn't have access to a lot of black people, a lot of people of color to talk to, but he can't wait to talk to to me, and and get my opinion on anything that's happening, that has happened since the last time we saw each other. He wants to know, he wants to understand, he wants to know how I feel, he even wants to know what could he do to make it better in the world, and that's a step forward. I think I've changed him just like he's changed me. And I think the way he saw himself when he was when he was coming up, he realizes that that was wrong. And now he understands we need to, 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 to stand up and say something. When I first used to talk to him, he didn't understand Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. He was all about, you had to stand for the flat. That's not how he is now. He doesn't believe that. He understands that you can separate him. And that's the difference. We have to be willing to talk, but more than that, we have to be willing to listen. And not just listen with your ears and be ready to defend, but listen with your ears and let it sink into your heart. At the end of every episode, we leave you with a quote. My executive director believes very strongly in the arts. And she wanted me to take time out to maybe come up with my own quote or a poem or something to say, how I feel or, you know, to represent what this episode has brought out of me. And I wrote a poem, if you can call it a poem. When we asked for freedom, they said, we'd rather die first. Civil War. And then the day was done and we had won the war and we wanted our civil rights they said, we'd rather kill you first. Jim Crow, lynching, police brutality, housing discrimination, joblessness, and subpar education. We passed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Act and affirmative action. And now they push reverse discrimination, voter suppression, because they need that back.
Remember to follow us on all the social media platforms. Subscribe to the channel. Comment. Leave us a comment. Like, subscribe, and share. Share this video with your family and friends. See what they say. See what moments change them and touch them when it comes to racial injustice or racial equality. Send us an email. Keep sending us your questions. And remember, until I see you again in two weeks, I love you.